So let us return to the meditation space, the inner space. In the name of love eternal, in the name of love incarnate, in the Christ, in us. In the name of love flowing into us and out from us. In the name of love eternal, in the name of love incarnating in the Christ, in us. In the name of love flowing into us and love flowing out from us. Now in this session and the next one after lunch, we will, uh, Viv and I will be guiding meditations. Uh, to, uh, to do with uh, the Virgin Mary, Mary the mother. And exploring with you the, the qualities of that mother feminine in her and in us. What kind of qualities do we need to incarnate the Christ, to be incarnating the Christ? And uh, for those uh, who were uh, um, late to book and who might not have absorbed quite um, we're working with the idea in these sessions of a, an, an advent wreath. So four candles with a, a fifth to be added on Christmas Day. And each candle representing a quality of Mary. And traditionally, the, the, the wreath, the candles would be set in a circular wreath, perhaps representing the one, usually of evergreen material. So we're working with this idea, which you might make actual between the, between the, um, these sessions. That's up to you. So I'd like to invoke now the Divine Feminine as Mother with these words of Hildegard of Bingen. Mary, ground of all being, greetings. Mary, O luminous mother, holy, 
healing art. You have indeed conquered death. You have established life. Ask for us life. Ask for us radiant joy. Ask for us the sweet, delicious ecstasy that is forever yours. Mary, your womb exalts. It, it exalts like grass, grass the dew has nestled on. Grass the dew has infused with verdant strength. That is how it is with you, mother of all joy. You, glowing, most green, verdant sprout. In the movement of the spirit, in the midst of wise and holy seekers, you bud forth into light. So let us come into the presence of Mary, the mother, ground of all being, establisher of life. And in feeling for the quality of purity, that quality of virginity, let us perhaps recall virgin forest. a state of wildness. A state of intercommunication. A state of openness. A state of being aware, being highly sensitive like a deer in the forest. So 
let us drink with all breath this state of purity and virginity, this openness as we breathe in. Feeling all the, the dust and awkwardness and fixity that is of the mind dissolve in this drenching and letting that go on the exhalation, breathing in the, the nourishment of the forest. Feeling it slake one's thirst inside. And breathing in everything that feels just too dry, too fixed. There's a lovely legend about Mary, which I found in a, a little book by Rowan Williams, and you may know it. In the legend, Mary uh, is a maiden at the temple. And she is given the task of weaving the veil which hangs in front of the Holy of Holies. And the threads are red and purple. And for some reason she has to take it home. And she takes it home to Nazareth and she works there on her loom, weaving this precious veil. And at some point she needs to get up from the loom and when she's weaving with the red thread and go and draw water from the well. And she goes and, and does that and waiting at the well is the angel or the archangel Gabriel. But Mary is not aware, and she doesn't see him. So she goes back with the water and continues weaving. And sometime later, she's weaving with a purple thread. And she has to go down to the well and draw water. And the angel Gabriel is waiting at the well and she sees him. She's aware 
she's present, and he gives her his message. And eternity can pierce the veil of the temporal, the ordinary. And the Christ can incarnate. And there is something in this story which brings back the story of the meeting of the Samaritan woman and Jesus at the well when he says to her if you believe in me from your belly will come living waters if you believe in me from your belly will come living waters Christ, the living water. And to believe we have to be open. We have to be in that virginal, pure state where the impossible becomes possible and miracles are normal. Whether one thinks of the stories of Christmas in the Bible as true, factually, or metaphorically. It is indeed a miracle that the divine is incarnated in us, I think. So I'd like to read a poem which is called Gabriel's Annunciation from Jan Richardson. For a moment, I hesitated. This is Gabriel speaking. For a moment, I hesitated on the threshold. For the space of a breath, I paused, unwilling to disturb her last ordinary moment, knowing that the next step would cleave her life, that this day would slice her story in two dividing all the days before from all the ones to come. The artists would later depict the scene, Mary, dazzled by the angel, her head bowed in humble assent, awed by the messenger who condescended to leave paradise to bestow such an honor upon a woman and mortal. Yet, I tell you, it was I who was dazzled. I who found myself agape when I came upon her, reading at the loom, in the kitchen. I cannot now recall only that the woman before me 
blessed and full of grace, long before I called her so, shimmered with how completely she inhabited herself, inhabited the space around her, inhabited the moment that hung between us. I wanted to save her from what I had been sent to say. Yet, when the time came, when I had stammered the invitation, history would not record the sweat on my brow, the pounding of my heart, would not note that I said, do not be afraid to myself as much as to her. It was she who saved me, her first deliverance, her let it be, not just declaration to the divine, but a word of solace, of soothing, of benediction for the angel in the doorway who would hesitate one last time just for the space of a breath torn from his chest before wrenching himself away from her radiant consent, her beautiful and awful yes. So let us open. Let us be virginal. And let us use the Aramaic word, Ephetar. Ephetar. It's the word which Jesus uses to heal uh, somebody that is deaf and dumb, as it's called in the Bible. He says, Ephetar, be opened. And the word has roots to do with not only opening, but enlightenment. And the opening of a flower So let us invoke this quality in us. So we'll repeat out loud rather like we did with Maranatha, with Tim this morning. Efeta. 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 Efeta, 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 Efeta. Efeta. And thinking this sacred sound, Efeta, this word of power on the in breath and on the exhalation, drawing it in deeper. Don't be afraid, open, open to the divine.
and letting go of the sound or the thought sound. Just being in the essence. of virginity. Amen. And now I'm going to invite Viv to take us for the next part of this session. And you're ready, Viv? Thank you, Joe. Greetings, everyone. We come now to the second quality. We shall need on our journey through Advent. Quality of humility. From the point of light within the heart of God, let light stream forth into human hearts. Let light descend on earth. It's when we face for a moment the worst our kind can do and shudder to know the taint in our own selves, that awe cracks the mind shell and enters the heart not to a flower, not to a dolphin, to no innocent form, but to this creature, vainly sure that it and no other is godlike. God out of compassion for our ugly failure to evolve, entrusts as guest, as 
brother, sister, the word. So the second quality of Mary, of the Divine Feminine, which we need on our journey through Advent, is humility. But what is this quality? It's easy to misconstrue it. A wonderful example, Mr. Collins from Pride and Prejudice. And above all, perhaps, Uriah Heap from Dickens' novel, David Copperfield. When I was quite a young boy, I got to know what humbleness did, and I took to it. I ate humble pie with an appetite. I stopped at the humble point of my learning, and says I, hard, hard. When you offered to teach me Latin, I knew better. People like to be above you, says Father. Keep yourself down. I am very humble, Master Copperfield, but I've got a little power. Father and me was both brought up at a foundation for boys and mother. She was likewise brought up at a public sort of charitable establishment. They taught us all a deal of humbleness. Not much else that I know of. From morning to night, we was to be humble to this person and humble to that, and to pull off our caps here and to make bows there, and always to know our place and abase ourselves before our betters. Father got made a sexton by being humble, In that last sentence is the clue. This is not humility, simply a disguise for a lust for power. Many of us still carry the effects of centuries of church, I won't say Christian teachings, about obedience, knowing our place, not getting above ourselves, and the need for self-abasement before the majesty of an almighty God. That is not humility. That is a denial of human worth and dignity. God, out of our compassion, out of compassion for our ugly failure to evolve, entrusts as guest our sister, brother, the word. There's a lovely Sufi story which illustrates more subtly the true quality of humility. It's about a man called Ayaz, a poor man who rose to be chief servant and companion to a great sultan. 
courtiers, jealous of his influence, noticed that every morning he would visit a locked room in the palace and spend time there. Feeling sure he was up to no good and probably storing treasure there for himself, they persuaded the Sultan to spy on him. And what they saw was Ayaz in an almost empty room, take off his rich garments, put on a tattered cloak and battered slippers that hung there and study himself in a mirror. When the astonished Sultan later asked him why he did this, he replied, I come here every day to remind myself of what I was. I must always remember that whatever I have today is due to the favor of the Sultan and is giving, given to me as a loan. After that, I begin my job of the day. And behind that story of true humility, of course, is the teaching that we are entirely dependent on the one being of which we are a part. for all that we have and all that we are. Humility is very difficult. Friends of mine are always telling me that I put myself down. That is not humility. That's low self-esteem. Many of us stuff, suffer with that but it gets in the way of true humility, which involves dignity. What humility is, is the attainment of that state in the reading this morning. The absence the total absence of self-reflective consciousness. This is the humility that Mary showed when she said to the angel in the beautiful words of the King James Bible, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord be it unto me according to thy word. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. So this is the quality of humility we need as we prepare our hearts to open to the birth of the Christ in us. I suggest we reflect on those subtle notions 
around the concept of true humility. Can we unpick the layers of deception, self-deception, and reach that true quality of humility exemplified by the story of Mary and the angel. are other barriers to reaching the state of humility and openness to a consciousness which is without self. One is grudges held, hurts still in our hearts, the inability to forgive another or others, 
and even harder the inability to forgive ourselves. I'm going to offer you now a practice some of you may know, which I have found can be very powerful in this issue of forgiveness. Sometimes it yields astonishing results very quickly. Sometimes they come over time. The practice is called Ho Opono Pono. Ho Opono Pono. And it will be given you after the session. So now I ask you to think of someone you need for, to forgive. Perhaps it's a very deep hurt, perhaps it's something slight, but it's on your mind and on your heart. And holding that thought and feeling, repeat these sentences. I am sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. I am sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. Amen. You can practice this for longer during the retreat if you wish. Next, think of something you find hard to give yourself, for, to forgive yourself for. A hurt you did to someone else or a fault that's difficult to overcome. And repeat the four phrases. I am sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you.
And the second practice I offer you is a bowing practice. It's often very effective to perform a physical action that mirrors the intention of a prayer. So for this practice, sit or kneel and aloud or inwardly as you bow down, say, I am the Lord's servant. And as you rise, say, may your word be fulfilled in me. Mary's words after the visitation of the angel. I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled in me. I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled in me. I offer you also a contemplation, the words of which will be on your sheet, as a kind of koan, a Zen koan, contemplate these words of Rumi. If I did not show you my nothingness, what would I be useful for? If I did not show you my nothingness, what would I be useful for? and prayer. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I welcome everything that comes to me today because I know it's for my healing. I welcome all thoughts, feelings, emotions, persons, situations, and conditions. I let go of my desire for power and control. I let go of my desire for affection, esteem, approval, and pleasure. I let go of my desire for survival and security. I let go of my desire to change any situation, condition, person or myself. I open to the love and presence of God and God's action within. 
Amen. And with that, we may light our second candle to the quality of humility. Thank you.